Hello. So uh, my name's Hayley. I head up our tech and IT recruitment at Core. Um, I have been here for nearly 10 years now, nine years about a month ago. And in fact, today, nine years ago, I made my first placement with Core. Uh, that came up as a Facebook reminder. Um, and uh, we are today having a chat with Erica Livermore. Did I just say your name right? I'm now really worried that I said it. I did, fantastic. Um, uh, and this is all part of our series um, of uh, female leaders. Um, we're holding regular events, getting together female leaders and having people um, stand up and, and speak to us about interesting subjects. Um, I That's probably me in a nutshell. So I'm gonna hand over to Erica and Erica, I'm gonna let you do a bit of an introduction of yourself. Thanks, Ailey. Thank you very much for having me today as well. Um, so, as you said, my name is Eric Livermore. Um, well, you know, I have 20 years experience in hospitality, retail, um, leisure and business processing, outsourcing. Um, I started my career as a low graduate. So I come to it from a very difficult, different angle. And my objective in life was to become a judge. Um, I came to hospitality to fund my trouble all those 20 years ago. Oh, did we all? <laughs> yeah, we did, indeed. But, uh, you know, I think like many people, it's become a passion and a way of life. I think hospitality is one of those sectors that when you start, you find it really difficult to live. Yeah. Um, you know, I went through various different iterations of what a journey in hospitality looked like. My first role was four days after graduation, arriving in London and landing a job as door host of Maxwell's in Covent Garden. <laughs> so that was a little bit of a shock to the system. I even studied English in Italy for most of my life. All of a sudden, I had to actually understand what people were saying to me. <laughs> and I had to answer the phone. And that first phone call, I think, was the most dramatic moment of my life. <laughs> Panic set in, but then I kind of managed to relax and get into the role and spent quite a few interesting months on that door. Um, you know, when Covent Garden really was the center of London and everything yeah. was really happening. Um, after that, I kind of learned to be a bartender. I went to work for Break for the Border, which at the time was an institution in London with many fun nights. And from Barton, I kind of moved to the ranks to become a general manager, looking after um, Christmas and all our Christmas bookings and our events and the big parties, et cetera, because the event side of the business always really interested me a lot. And then I moved to All by One in their graduate scheme. And I started to kind of, you know, my career where I landed my first opening store for um, All by One in Cannon Street in the city when the city was really starting to change. And I had to say, I saw some interesting things there when one of my, um, you know, one of my uh, very, let's say, wealthy um, customer decided that because um, it just made a massive trade, it wanted to play golf at the top of a um, um, Lauren Perry arose there on my floor at lunchtime <laughs> and he thought it was a great idea. <laughs> So, yeah, that's why you stay in hospitality. So many things that happen to you, you know, you yeah. kind of remember them like it was yesterday. And then, um, you know, I kind of finally managed to save enough money to go traveling after four and a half years where I was in London. I thought now is the time. A few things were changing. And I said, if I don't take the opportunity now, I know we're going to do it. So, I took a lovely year out, went traveling in Southeast Asia, in Australia. And, uh, you know, I ended up in America for a little bit before coming back. And uh, then I settled down a little bit. I had a, a family, had my first daughter and thought, oh, at this point, you know, life starts and I need to be serious about building a career. Hence, you know, I started working with business processing outsourcing for a large company called Transform Worldwide. Um, and that's where really my journey in technology started. I um, absolutely loved Transcom. It was the forefront of everything that was happening back in those days. And it was very early days, but they were early adopter. Being part of the Kinovic group, they had, you know, quite substantial fund and a very strong corporate behind everything that we did. And therefore, you know, we started heavily in that journey, investing in technology, really bringing, you know, to customer service the power of what tech could do. And um, I worked, you know, I started as a team leader and five years after that, I left as a, um, a business manager for not just the site I worked on, but across all the five sites that we had since opened in Italy. And um, I worked with very many um, 
not just intelligent people, but also people that were able to share the knowledge and translate everything that was technical into language that everybody could understand. And that's what really started to kind of make me think, actually, tech is something I really enjoy. And that's where my career really started to move towards tech um, has a passion, tech has a way of wanting to you know, develop and learn more and, and really become um, a leader in the sector and, and mm. understand how I could use tech to um, empower the businesses I worked with to become really successful. Um, so I moved back to the UA, UK after because, um, you know, I don't know if I mentioned, but um, while I was at uni, I met a lovely English fan. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, while before I was really happy to travel and to live in Italy for a while, he really felt like he wanted to come back home. So we kind of made the decision to move back here to be close to his family. And when I arrived back, I kind of started to look around and I started to work for the Devere Hotel Group. Yeah. And I spent the best part of nine years with Devere. Um, and I was there through the various interaction of the business where Richard Barford Lynn bought, you know, the Devere properties from uh, Lord Darsbury, I did villager hotels and leisure, and then Hotel de Vene, Mar And, um, you know, at, at one point um, in the AHG portfolio, which is what it was called at the time, we had Liberty of London, you know, the, yeah. the retail department store. We had J&G Greenalls in the portfolio. We had Greens Health Club. So very vast. So and MWB Holdings as well. So it was a very vast business. And in there, I kind of, um, out, you know, my business processing outsourcing for the things, that's one of the reasons why I joined the beer, was really to look at how we um, manage our customers and how we made that really efficient because the group had become so big that we really needed to make sure we were servicing every part of our customer portfolio. So we kind of instituted um, a big contact center. We outsourced that. We used technology and particularly CRM technology yeah. to really understand, you know, sales, booking patterns, um, you know, what our customers like, what they dislike, how could we help them um, in terms of, you know, uh, discover us more often, become more accessible, get their return visits more and more. So, and, and you know, making sure that when they left, they had a fantastic experience with us. Um, and at the same time, we started to look, you know, within the um, hotel portfolio and the various part of the business, what we could do to improve sales, to improve processes, to make ourselves more efficient. So that was a really interesting journey for nine years. And I think, you know, I, I knew technology was really from a passion. Like, um, after the beer, I was, um, you know, through an associate, like those things happen normally. I was tapped when, when Principal Alien and uh, Starwood Capital bought the Devere portfolio. I stayed there for about a year, up, a year after that. But then somebody knocked on the door and said, there's a great opportunity to become, you know, somebody's looking, it's a small business, but they're looking for a managing director. The business is very ripe for transformation. They've been really successful, but they have done that the old way of doing business. So there isn't a website, there isn't a sales strategy, there isn't you know, financial systems and all the rest of it. But there is a very strong, solid customer base that are really loyal. So I took the plunge and I thought, you know, I always thought I could be a very good business leader and, and run a business as well as, um, you know, being the technical mind behind it. And also, I believe, you know, the way I manage people and, and the way I build a relationship with customers has always helped me. So I spent about four years as the MD of this corporate travel agency mm. uh, up until the point where we were bought out by Clark Craig's Travel Management, which is quite big in the industry, and our investors wanted to exit the business. So we kind of made a sale, and that was, you know, we had customers like Siemens Group. Uh, we went for the whole of Siemens in the UK and DPD Group, et cetera. So it was a really strong business, and, and we had a lot of fun in the process. You know, rebuilding the website, like not rebuilding, but creating a website, creating a brand, creating, you know, the tools that our customers and our team members could use to uh, make, speed things up and, and, you know, have clarity of what was happening across, you know, all of our business was 
um, instrumental in that sale and what we did and the product that we created. Um, so it's extremely proud of us. And after that, I moved to Virgin Active, um, the health club, um, mainly, you know, loads of lit regional location with my long, um, strong London focus, um, where I was the customer experience and, in, uh, and intelligence director. Um, so again, really exciting times for Virgin, um, a lot of transformation, a lot of consolidation. I got to the business after, you know, they um, looked at their portfolio, made sure the portfolio was really strong and that there was a, a clear need for us to then improve, you know, our membership systems, our membership communications, et cetera. And therefore, I was able to help and support them in establishing all of those, um, you know, systems and processes and having that in place for a successful um, kind of um, story, really. And then COVID happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was quite funny because when COVID happened, I had a call um, from a very, you know, a person that I've known for many years that I worked with in very many different iterations when I never worked for. Um, and that person said, I am now going to um, work at TGI Fridays and I would like you to join me on that journey. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a brand I've not had for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I remember back in the days when I first came to London and in Covent Garden, it was this place where everybody was flaring and having a great time. I thought, you know, maybe I've, I've missed, you know, what happened to this brand in a while. And I did a bit of research and I thought, wow, what an exciting time. And you know, um, when I had that phone call, the point was we really have a huge opportunity here to move a business into the 21st century and, you know, kind of operate a lot of digital transformation and get rid of technical debt and move forward. And so it was really exciting. I decided to join, spent three years, fantastic years at Fridays, great journey, great team made you know a huge amount of progress and um, in the in, you know in spite of everything that the world has thrown to us you know we started our first pick and collect and delivery service which we've never done before very successful we did a lot of you know kind of change from the grounds up from you know uh, operational to um customer facing and that's it's a bit about me in an actual and my story really <laughs> Amazing. It's so funny. I mean, I've in the time that I've been at core recruitment, I've re I've recruited for FMCG and originally hospitality. And I have a hospitality background myself and a lot. So many people that I speak to, you know, how did you get into it? Well, I was taking a break from university or, you know, I was just trying to earn a bit of money and people just fall in love with it, don't they? Yeah, I think it's, it becomes part of your life. It's, it's yeah. infectious. Yeah. I think because it's a people's business yeah. and, you know, um, it's very sociable as well. You know, yeah. there's loads of, you know, it's, it's loads of people say we play hard, you know, work hard and we yeah, play hard. Yeah. But I think in hospitality, it really is do. true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on both sides. Um. <laughs> but also, I think you make a huge network, don't you? People yeah very kind and I think people are very um able to help one another yeah. and and to contribute to your professional growth yeah. as well as your yeah. social side of things so yeah. I think you know that's what I've noticed from when working in you know more of a proper corporate nine to five Monday yeah. to Friday's job to actually our societies are, you know, we a lot of time in various different. You know, I've I've always kind of enjoyed being in a store, being really busy and jumping on the bar and helping out or clearing yeah, up the yeah. table, having a chat with a customer. You know, and and see what they thought and why what if they were having really fun. And it's just you know you make connections. De oh, definitely. I mean, I'm still um, really good friends with you know my first GM job in London twenty years ago, and we're still really close and you know I, I stood up and, and did a speech at my friend's wedding and um, I think yeah it is it's pretty unique experience isn't it I mean I know since that time <laughs> I'm remembering back to uh, um, a little bar in Fulham that I was managing my first GM job and you know like technology then I mean we had I think we had dial-up um, I don't yes. think I don't think <laughs> I don't think you could use the card machine if someone was on the internet in the office um yeah. so I know that there's been a lot of changes <laughs> in technology since then um what what have you seen sort of since your career and, and has there been sort of bigger changes since the pandemic in terms of tech in the industry yeah 
I think, you know, um, I mentioned this briefly before. My biggest change that I've seen, a first real big change that I've seen was the advent of the CRM kind of yeah. technology. I think before, um, you know, the way we kind of looked at information and where we had information was mostly was in people's heads. You know, your customers were interested, you, which is fantastic, you know, um, because you've got a workforce that's really engaged, but it's not sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think for me, the introduction to CRM, I started working when I was at Transcom with Altitude um, and they were a very small company at the time, formed at the same time the sales force was formed, um, you know, and they were coming out of um, the um, Southern Europe. And, and it was, well, we can kind of see you know, our customers' information, how many times they called us, who they bought, how they've done it, when they've done it, have they had any problems, you know, have the salespeople going out and seeing them, you know, what information. And that was a real revolution, I think, for me, because it allowed us to kind of speed operations up, increase, you know, profitability, increase customer satisfaction, and also... Yeah, a lot of people talk about personalization. That's where the journey started. That's really very much whereby we had all the information on our fingertip. And if we used it really well and we kind of adapt all our systems to actually use that data and, and share that data across different systems, technical people as well as sales people, as well as customer services people, you know, could have all in one place and make the interaction with customers really, really of value. So I think that to me was the start of a real change. And, you know, everything has come after, obviously, in various different areas um, has had impact. But to me, to, to come the way we run operation at scale for large, you know, as well as small companies has been the, the biggest real change, the first real change. Since the pandemic, you know, it's been, it's been interesting. Hasn't it's it? been a lot of technology. <laughs> There has been a lot of, um, you know, things that people have had to adapt. I, I think as a sector, we've always been a bit sceptical of technology and a bit scared of technology. And it's because, you know, always when you speak to operators, always like, but the casual dining in the hotel, you know, it's all about interaction between guests. And, and yeah. so there is a real belief that if you try to automate or introduce technology, then the experience suffers instead of in a lot of other, you know, sectors whereby I people think, actually, I can take the transactional element out of it, make the things in it to work really speedily and quickly, efficient, and then leave the people to have that very rich interaction. Um, and so during the period, you know, because of the pandemic, everybody had to exponentially invest in technology and be, you know, able to service the food at home, you know, like the third party delivery, you know, how do we kind of integrate all the systems that we've never had before, people that never done click and collect delivery. So everybody had to come to terms with the fact that they needed to adopt technology. And then the fact that you couldn't, you know, have interaction close back to people, the pay a table, the QR codes, the ordering, you know, everybody had to to do it it wasn't a question of do we think it's the right thing for our business are we making investment currently so that you know long term there is a return and all the rest of it everybody has gone it i think now we're on the other side of things and i think people now because they've been pushed in that in that way now it's about that consolidation and understanding okay what does our business really need how can yeah. we make the most of it you know workforce management and um, you know um ordering management and um, communications with members of staff and you know agility in terms of rotors there's all these things and now we're adopting more because we're becoming finally as a set of more agile we're becoming like we understand and it's i think it's been driven by the people we're employing because you know whatever we like it or not the generations have changed the expectation of change not just in the customers but in the people we employ we need to be able to communicate to them in the right place, be able to surface the information to them as quickly as possible, make them part of that process. So I think for me, what's really interesting I've seen, apart from the various adoptions and, you know, some people continue the journey, some people drop the journeys and go back to, you know, pen and paper or whatever it is that they think is more right. The thing that I've seen is most exciting is robotics and automation. I think there is some people in the industry that are doing things that are fantastic. And for the businesses that are going to adopt them correctly without being scared of it, but, you know, to make it, 
you know, if you look at it at the moment, the biggest challenge for everybody is profitability. You know, costs are through the roots. You've got inflation. You've got labour shortages. You've got So it's about the winners are going to be the people that made themselves really operationally efficient are able to invest in the right, you know, team members, give back to this team members so they, they stay loyal and they flourish. And therefore, I think automation could really, and, and robotics, in the kitchens particularly, you know, there is a lot of stuff that has been done in the kitchen terms. And I'm not talking about, you know, just robot flipping burgers or making pizzas, <laughs> you know. There's a lot of stuff. It, it, it sounds crazy, but if you think about it, in a restaurant where the fryers are very busy, for example, just yeah. the ability to have robotics there and to cook at a perfect time and to always have the same amount of fries, you know, that rem- that's huge in, in terms of consumption of our hot oil and, you know, how efficient our operation is in terms of margins and, and operationally become, or in the kitchen in terms of, you know, helping, you know, the, the, the kitchen display screens, for example, technologies increase so much and improves so much. It really helps chef to do something really well every single yeah. time. So I think, you know, that is, to me, really, I, I look at that very, very closely. Um, I have looked at some of the robots as well that are around the stores that kind of, you know, help out to clear tables and to help bring... I think that's fun and, and that's, you know, could also help done in the right way. I, I think you know, the world is changing and, and things are changing. We're going to have to adapt. And, you yeah. Know, eventually we're going to get there and it is about how do we do it in a way that helps everybody enjoy everything more, not just the customers, but a member of staff and, and the shareholders ultimately as well because you've got very operational efficiency that can actually, you know, um, makes it profitable. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Uh, Christian and I were at um, a conference, I think, last year. I can't, I can't remember um, which one it was now, but the Hamyard Hotel. And I think it was, um, I think it was Boparan Group. Yes. And they were trialing using robots for um, basically taking the, the food that was going out on Deliveroo and Just Eat, rather than someone having to walk from the kitchen to the front to hand over a bag of food to a delivery driver, pop it on the robot, the robot goes out there automatically, delivers it and go back. What a fantastic use of yeah. of it because that's not taking away the kind of personal touch from hospitality side of things but also you're you're saving you know time and effort for your kitchen staff that can then focus on what they're doing absolutely and if you think about you know loads of businesses that to kind of think about different models within the same you know four walls and you need to be able to do more with what you already have and what's probably not being built purposely for that and therefore, as you said, you know, using technology in the areas whereby you're not impacting, you know, actually yeah. you are helping, you know, the team members to be able to still focus and concentrate on people that are, have come in to dine by still being able to service that part of the business because you need to, from a profitability point of view, you need to expand your offer. But, you know, you're doing it in a way that actually is very effective. Mm. And therefore, you know, when people understand the club, when they understand a business model and they understand where they can actually put it, that is going to make a real difference to everybody in the equation. So you get a buy-in from everybody. I think that's where technology is the yeah. most successful yeah. adoption point, really. Uh, agreed, yeah. So what would be your recommendation for a key piece of technology whether in sort of retail or hospitality yeah. what what do you think is that most important thing that's going to help the business grow I guess this is you know when when big question. Um, <laughs> it is a big question and I think it's an interesting one because you know you can spend shell of money on technology you can yeah. you know you can go down a rabbit hole that doesn't bring any and I think that's the mistakes that quite a lot of people make because they feel like they have to make a change Mm. I think what the most important thing is and where you can make sure your investment is really successful is when you take a step back and you really understand what is it that you are trying to achieve and why I think that piece of tech would be really different from every business depending where they are in their journey and what their history is you know if you take a business for example that is very um you know, it's been established for many years. You're probably going to have 
you know, a, a series of um, technology solutions that have been all kind of built on top of one another and have created a lot of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll say, you know, for those businesses, really, OK, look at it and understand, you know, how can you simplify what you're doing? Because obviously, if you've got this complex stuff, the potential is not talking to it, that to one another, potentially is kind of, you know, making the job of the front line even more difficult than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, when you're going to know, OK, this is what I need to know. So, you know, to understand where you're going to invest next and where you're going to do it, you really need to understand where you're coming from and where you are in your journey. And what, you know, what, what problem are you trying to resolve? You know, have you mm. got a problem that you need to resolve or it's just a question of exponentially um, looking at how can you grow to the next level? So if you've got an issue that is about actually you're not reaching customers and if there's a, re a reason that you're not reaching your customers it's because you don't know your customers just coming through your doors and therefore you need to invest in that kind of tech that gives you that and then kind of takes your data through that journey. Um, you know, have you got an issue where they actually got a lot of wastage in your, in your business? You know, for example, you know, um, the recipe, it, I, I, I find, you know, one of the, most, if we're talking about um, casual dining, for example, or QSRs or, you know, the, the dining sector, um, I find, you know, menu engineering is, and also how we manage menu engineering is probably one of the most convoluted things. And, and there, you know, because also you kind of got this array of channels you need to be present on. If you look at a lot of businesses I've looked at, not just the ones I worked with, but also colleagues and, you know, as you said, meeting people up, you know, talking about conferences and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. It's always the piece. And in fact, I was talking to um, somebody yesterday. I've got very, very large operations. And, you know, when we're talking about, you know, what challenge, it always goes back to menu engineering and menu management. And if you think about it, because, um, you know, especially in the UK where you've got legislation that's quite strict as well, you know, you have to look at provenance, you have to look at calorie, you have to look at, um, you, you know, allergens. Natasha's law as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So you might, and then is how do you present to the customers? And, you know, if you're of a certain size, you have to show calorie, but you also have to be able not to show calories. You know, there is a lot of things that actually are really expensive in a business. And then the printing side of things is incredible. And the inflexibility that it gives you is even worse because, you know, you can't change things, that, you know, as quickly and, and, and as fast as you possibly wanted to. So I think, you need to understand where you are. Mm. I think, you know, there is a, with technology can be a really big spend, but also can be a massive um, efficiency drive in terms of really cutting costs. All the, all the changes I've always made have always been self-funding because, you know, if you actually look at what you have, you've got a lot of things that either not being used because they've been overspent by people that potentially, you know, weren't the subject matter expert when they were first implemented and therefore they've created more problems than they've solved. You can really, when you look through what you've got, you can really cut down the stack and, and put your money really where he's going to make the most value. So I'd say the biggest piece of, of tech that we recommend, you know, is the right piece of tech for yeah. your business. Yeah, that and makes if you sense. Don't understand, yeah, and if you don't understand what that is, don't even start. You need mm. to understand <laughs> what's... Well, and also, you know, with tech, you need to change your operations. Yeah. Tech can help you on its own. And this is, I think, where most people go wrong. Where you invest, you know, I call it intentionality. A lot of people want to invest in tech because aspiration, they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But you need to have real intention because with that change in tech, you need to change how you operate. Because, you know, I remember one time I was with a supplier and we were given an, a, a presentation. They put up a slide with a very simple, I was like, I love that. I'm going to use it every day of my life. And it was something on the lines that said, uh, new tech, old operation equal, very expensive, new, very expensive new tech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think people need to come on their journey. And if, not everybody's coming on the journey then I don't think people should start it because it could yeah. end up really being you know detrimental to the business yeah I, I mean from a recruitment point of view I feel like I'm seeing more uh, positions coming up on the data side of things which is is fantastic you know the the 
I, I think, you know, as you've, you've, well, we've both mentioned, I think, you know, in the past, sort of hospitality sector was um, a bit tech phobic. Um, and I don't think we, we, you know, we had all of this data that was there to be taken and not really using it. And I'm, I think I'm seeing now more utilization of that data like you're saying from the crm point of view where it's okay who who are our, our customers you know what what do they want how can we make their experience better you know more from i guess pure data roles and then from companies like i don't know feed feed it back on the reputation management side of things or, or wireless social you know looking at, at data from who's kind of coming in and out of of your your property um That's and back of house is really important as well. You know, yeah. data is where it all starts. You really need to understand what how your operations perform to understand how to, you know, make those change that will give you that marginal gain. Um, you know, data to me is really at the basis of everything because you can't understand what you need to, you know, where you need to intervene unless you start from that. And it's great to see that that's happening now. Um, yeah. Because I think that can help you in the journey and then shape up your strategy mm. um, of, yeah. you know, where you need to intervene, really. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, not just customer side of things. It's very, very much about, you know, what are the employees saying, how they operate, what's yep. important to them, you know, how is our wastage going on, is there stuff on the menu that, you know, we deliver something. One thing I saw, and they're doing a lot of this in, in the Emirates, is very much about um, looking at what's returned on the plates to really under, because there is, you know, and also from an ESG point of view, there is a lot of wastage. We put a lot of things on our plates because we, we need to kind of make it look, but what are people actually eating or not eating? You know, what returns every time? What's not really been welcome? Do we have that information? There's a lot of stuff that you can use now where you can actually pull your scrapes and analyzes, you know, what's been wasted and gives it. There's a lot of very clever stuff. And, and now, you know, the amount of data that can be crunched very quickly it's incredible and um, we would be full if we don't use that you know yeah. every business could really really um make them so I, I think every everything we do is about we need to make sure um technology makes us more efficient in operational savvy and then brings all the departments together on the same journey agreed what do you think is the future for us I mean I know we sort of talked about the robotic side of things yeah. uh, is there going to be AI in hospitality I really hope I, not I after what I read this morning it's bound to be you know already there is a lot of use of AI in, in hospitality you know whether we like it or not is here it's gonna you know like every piece of technology you're not going to be able to stop it about how do you adopt, adapt it and adopt it as well. Adapt it to your business and adopt it within your business is really important. I think AI is definitely at stay, you know, um, there is a lot of transactions that actually um, become better ultimately for the consumer where there is consistency. And I think one of the things that humans really struggle is with that delivering consistency every single time. You know, you don't have that problem with AI. So I think from a customer point of view, from a marketing point of view, I think AI is going to be, you know, adopted at pace very quickly. Already, if you look at send time optimizations, for example, you know, AI crunch is a huge amount, you know, I get all my emails exactly when when I open them at the time I open them because the systems are being utilised. No, at what point I read that kind of stuff and they send it to me at the right time. The content is becoming more and more relevant to you know um, what I'm interested in. Obviously, I think there's still going to be the consumers kind of um, barriers to sharing. You know, especially I think with, with the legislation that we have in the UK and, and in Europe as well. You know, people are very savvy and they don't want to share, you know, so there's going to be a quid pro quo, you know, as businesses, we need to learn what we need to give our consumers for them to, you know, trust us and share their information with us. So I think from that point of view, absolutely. I think, you know, AI in terms of, um, you know, how robotics works, how um, we kind of improve the in-store experience as well. I think that will be utilised a lot. I think self-service, absolutely. I think, you know, the blend piece of self-service kiosk, obviously, retail were the first to utilise kiosk now in our sector, they're like just everywhere. And I think they will become, because, you know, whether we like it or not, we need to start also attract 
the new generation to our businesses and bring them through the fold. And, and it, you know, not everybody wants to have this, you know, two hours conversation with, with a server at the table, some people. And, and, and you know, and, and you need to, as a business, very successful business, you need to have choices and options for our customers. Yeah. So there are some people, you know, I was observing one very interesting when, when um, um, I did an opening of a QSR and I was sitting, you know, it was my first QSR. So I was sitting um, on the other side of the fence and I was observing how people were moving within the, the, the store, you know. And although there was no queue at the tills, but there was quite a few queue at the kiosk, the queue at the kiosk continued and nobody decided. Because some people like that empowerment of being able to manage their own transaction in their own time and without feeling the pressure. So I think definitely kiosks are here to stay and we're going to see automation on kiosks. And I think AI is going to come a lot into the kiosks. So, you know, that, that kind of journey whereby AI will be utilising the kiosk journey to, to improve that journey to upsell and, you know, do it in a way that is very subtle and very kind of efficient, if you like. It's going to be um, big. And I think some of the um, very savvy businesses will use it back of house a lot, um, you know, to really improve, um, you know, ordering, for example, is always a big issue whereby, you know, somebody's forgotten to place an order, all of a sudden you haven't got your delivery on Thursday and it's like, oh my God, let's all rush the cost. <laughs> <laughs> remember you know, it well. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think, you know, there is a lot of scope, um, but I think we need to take it without the worries I think we need to kind of try to embrace it to see how can that make our operation better Mm -hmm. and therefore sometimes that means to retain the best people we're going to need to pay them more but if the job satisfaction becomes better because you're doing something that actually only a human can do and you use the technology to complement that I think then you have the optimum um, situation really. Yeah, it's as I like you. You know, you said about having the choice. I remember coming out of um, the pandemic and obviously going from being all order and pay at table, and then having you know so the, the actual service side of things came back in. And actually, sometimes now having the choice between the two is great. You know, I think when when everything started going back to normal, actually going up to the bar felt quite novel and nice. But sometimes I just want to sit down and order it on on, my, on an app and have someone deliver it to me and not move. It It's it's nice to be able to kind of change and interchange between it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think choice, you know, as humans, we need choice. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Agreed. As- cognitive beings is important to have choices and it's important people to understand the customers and you know if what kind of choices they want yeah yeah cool so I mean just to kind of last question I guess um so just to kind of relate back, I guess, to our, our female leadership side of things, um, I, you know, I mean, working on the recruitment side within hospitality tech, I'm aware that we are in need of more women in the industry, certainly at a higher level. What what can we do better? What 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 do we need to do to in order to attract more people into the, the industry? I think um, from two sides, I think. Mm-hmm. A career in hospitality is still seen as um, sometimes not the greatest of careers. So I think it's really important that we make people outside of the industry understand how professionalised we are as an industry. And reach now, I think, from a female um, leader point of view, I think we don't reach out, you know, our network doesn't talk, it's not visible enough outside of the industry to make a case for the industry. Mm. And so I think, you know, the likes of Nisha, for example, Katona, she does a great job because she's out there, you know, um, a former barrister that has actually started a very, you know, she's a great, but we need more of that. We need representation outside of the industry because we tend, our events tend to be within the industry and we need our leaders to go out there and reach out to actually showcase our industry, showcase the opportunity. I talk, for example, schools a lot. Um, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, you, you know, when you talk to children, the parents want them to go in accountancy low or, you know, medicine, because there, there is money, there is a salary, there is a, a, a future and all the rest of it. And when I try to explain to them, actually, do you realise in hospitality you do have accountants, you do have low, you do have, you know, um, HR, you do have all of these things and you can kind of be upskill and have a 
it, it's kind of novel. It was still novel to them to think, oh my gosh, I didn't realize. I thought it was just servers and, and managers and you know delivery people and bartenders. They don't understand everything that goes with it. And it's a professional business that needs everything to prosper. Yeah. So I think our female leader need to make a case for our in the, I think Kate Nicholson does it quite well and and she's kind of more and more out there talking about the industry I think that must you know I think all the leaders in our this female they need to be out there talking about it I was I I was invited to speak at a women's in tech conference a couple of months ago and there was only two people from our industry it was me and somebody from Deliveroo all the university all the consultancy all the banking all the firm that they were all there and it was in excess of 350 lead, female leaders and non-leaders. There was only two people from our sector. Mm. You know, I, I, I was shocked. You know, I knew it was bad, but I didn't realize it was so bad. And everybody came up to me and, you know, after our panel discussion, and everybody said, this that sounds like a really interesting place to be. And, you know, and we need to shout about more. You know, we need to yeah. kind of talk about, but also we need to mentor people into it, coach people into it. And also, we need to kind of give career paths. I think within every business, we need, you know, what the likes of consultants in banking do really well. They create very clear career paths and they give opportunity to people, you know, if you want risk skill or upskill or, you know, that is available within those organizations. You know, if you look at automotive, I did a lot of work with BMW and Mercedes, for example. They have their schemes whereby people work for a year into every different department. You know, the consultancy students say, we don't. Unless, you know, people knock on the door and say, oh, I'm actually interested in HR, I'm actually interested in IT. There isn't a clear kind of career. So I think we need to open it up, make it that part of our culture and what we do and show people that, you know, you can change, you can access skill you can move horizontally as well as vertically and I think we need to conscientiously to make that change because that is when you attract talent because you know people see how they can you know if they've got that aspiration actually move within that organization yeah yeah interesting have you got any advice for someone that wanted um either to kind of reskill and get into the industry or someone at early stages that wants to get in anything you can offer yeah i think there is an organization in the uk at the moment it's called um girls in coding they're going doing a fantastic job you know they are drumming up and um, I think sometimes people think, oh, tech is a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult, it's a bit geeky, you know, it, it isn't. It's just even coding sometimes, you know, the new wave coding is quite interesting. It just gets you through the thinking of it. So I'd say, you know, kind of go on to one of those courses, see what it's like, UX designer or, for example, you know, CX designers, all really exciting bits and, and very interactive so I think people need to kind of look at that, do a few kind of look at what um, discipline they're interested in and look at, you know, do some of those test courses to say, is this for me or not for me? And then yeah. start from there. And I think there is a lot of organizations out there as well that are really looking to increase their quota. So I think at the moment is really the right time for female, you know, to get into tech not be scared about, we need to be mystifying tech. You know, one of the things that makes me laugh is everybody I talk to, oh, I don't do tech. And it's like, do you have a phone? Yes. How do you do your banking on my phone? How do you pay your bills on my phone? Have you got a computer? Yeah, how do you, oh, I do, you do tech every day. It, it's just, you know, this old concept, like people are not good at math. Mm. You know, you just need to actually think about the everyday situation and how much you use tech and, and you know, stop convincing yourself of certain things and just try and I think even the new generation is really different because you know being on TikTok Instagram and Facebook you know doesn't mean that they technologists you know they're using some tools like we all use it so even the younger generations have got sometimes a bit of a block in terms and I see that a lot when I go in schools whereby I think some schools are doing really really well at it's starting very early now to do a little bit of coding and obviously you know with things like Scratch now, where people can actually build games in seconds, is making, you know, I see sometimes some of the stuff my son does at 13, I'm like, oh, you're really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Show me how did you do that? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but there are so many different ways nowadays to get involved. And it's about, you know, looking at, there is loads of forums, there is a lot of network, there is a lot of mentorship at the moment that's been offered by everybody. And um, there's a lot of organisations that really want to increase the female quota. So there isn't um, a time as now to really get into tech if people want mm. to get into tech. Yeah, I mean, you just described me when it comes to, oh, no, I don't do tech. I, I got uh, an F in my computer studies GCSE. It was <laughs> <laughs> the worst one. And I think I spent years thinking that, you know, I didn't know anything about tech and I didn't use it. And then I upskilled myself to be able to recruit for it. And actually, it's although there, yeah, you know, there's a lot of terms you need to learn, especially when it comes to developers. But but actually, it, it isn't as terrifying as you no. think. And a lot of it is, it comes down to sort of the problem solving and Absolutely. logic. Absolutely. And, and that is, you know, that is that critical thinking and problem solving is the two skills you really need to be successful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, also at the moment, cyber, for example, is incredibly um, hot topic. And there is a lot of opportunity in cyber and upskilling in cyber. And, and, and you know, it's not once you get into it is you know people say oh that's really boring it's not it's such an interest but you need to learn a little bit about it get a little bit involved to understand if that floats your boat or not but there are so many opportunities across the tech um landscape at the moment that you know it's really exciting yeah yeah and and definitely from a minute i know from from a recruitment point of view you know, we I have conversations with clients about diversity and inclusion, and often, you know, they're saying that we're quite male heavy, and we we really want to diversify our workforce and get more women involved. Um, so there are lots of opportunities there for sure. Well, thank you so much for your time, Erica. I've, honestly, this has been really good. I've, I, it's been really interesting and really useful, um, and yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you do. Thank well. you. I have, I have. It's been really, you know, when you proposed to do this, I thought, oh, I don't, you didn't know what to expect. But it's been really good fun. And as I said, good. we should make it a Friday appointment now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It wasn't. It was our first time doing it, and actually, I think we yeah. smashed it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, great well look I think um, just to wrap up um, I think you know we've got lots going on at core recruitment for our sort of female leadership uh, events and we've also got regular events for our LGBTQ plus A events have a look on our website get in touch I think if there's anyone else out there that wants to get involved and get in an interview or speak at any of those events give us a call but um, we're going to wrap up there and I think I'm going to get another interview booked in because I quite enjoyed this <laughs> fantastic thanks thank you so Great. much thanks